we're ready to get started on this wonderful talk about healthy vegetarian living. I wanted to tell you a little bit about this wonderful speaker that we have today. Uh, this is Dr. Armaiti May. She is a practicing Zoroastrian and a small animal veterinarian with a veterinary house call practice in Los Angeles. And just as an aside, I've had the good fortune to have my cat, Toby, uh, <laughs> examined and treated by her, so I'm very fortunate about that. Um, Dr. May obtained her veterinary degree from the University of California, Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. She obtained her doctorate of veterinary medicine in June 2005. After graduating from veterinary school, Dr. May spent 20 months at a 24-hour emergency dog and cat hospital. She is a longtime vegan, and for those of you who may not be as familiar with that lifestyle or who may uh, not be sure of the differences between veganism and vegetarianism, you'll learn a little bit about that today. And uh, she's a wonderful, compassionate animal advocate speaking on behalf of those who don't have a voice. Dr. May is also currently the president of Vegan Toastmasters, speaking again on behalf of animals. And she has attended and shared her insights at various Zoroastrian congresses over the years, uh, speaking on vegetarianism and Zoroastrianism. And she's gonna talk a little bit about that today. Please welcome Dr. Armaiti May. Thank you very much, Shanaz. It's an honor to be here and with all of you today. Thank you for coming to my talk. So can I just see a show of hands? How many vegetarians do we have in the audience? All right. And how many of those vegetarians are vegan? All right, great. Well, hopefully by the end of the talk today, all of your hands will be up <laughs> if I'm successful. So. The, the topic today is healthy vegetarian living, but I'm going to be talking about the plant-based diet and why it's important for health reasons as well as the environmental and ethical implications. So first we'll, we'll start off with some basic definitions so everyone's on the same page. And uh, before I get started, I just want to make a general statement of the fact that since Ora Mazda has given us the duty to protect our fellow creatures and show kindness to animals as well as helping our fellow beings, human beings, this is something that we have to take responsibility for as well as taking care of our own health and taking care of the planet. So you'll see by the end of this talk why this all ties together. And this is from Ferverton Yash, Karda 24, Ustano Zato Atravio Spitamo Zaratustro. At the birth of Zaratustra, all of nature rejoiced and exclaimed, Blessed are we that the prophet Spitama Zaratustra is born. So Zaratustra had a vision for us to take care of the creatures on this planet, too. Many of you have probably heard of Bama Nemeshaspan, which is one of the seven Nemeshaspentas. And in the spiritual order, uh, Bhaman overlooks animal welfare and follows Aura Mazda in the spiritual order. The month of Bhaman is recognized as a month of abstinence from flesh foods. And as you'll see as we go further, there, this applies to dairy and eggs as well. There are some serious problems with the way those foods are produced. In every month, we have Baman, Moor, Gosh, and Ram Roj. Yesterday was Gosh Roj, so that's why um, many people chose to not consume any animal foods that day. But that should really ideally be every day that we, we don't partake of this. So why is that? Well, for one thing, it's better for our health, and I'm going to be talking a lot more about that. It's also better for our planet. It allows food to be fed directly to people instead of then being fed to animals first who are slaughtered for people to eat. It's much uh, more inefficient to produce usable calories by feeding grain and soybeans and corn to cows and other livestock to then be fed to people as opposed to feeding the people those foods directly. 
and it's also better for the animals who are otherwise enduring untold suffering. It also tastes wonderful and it feels great. So according to the American Dietetic Association, which is a well-respected body, eating a well-balanced whole foods vegan diet that emphasizes fresh fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, seeds, and whole grains drastically reduces one's risk for heart disease, stroke, obesity, hypertension, and cancers of the breast, prostate, and colon. Now I want you to stop and, and think about that for a second and what that means. Stroke, hypertension, heart disease, obesity, and cancers of the colon, breast, and prostate. How many times have you heard about a friend, a relative, a loved one ha having illness or dying on account of one of those things? I mean, we hear about it almost every day, I think. And especially in our community, we, we have issues with those issues. So what's the difference between uh, vegan and vegetarian? There are different types of vegetarian diets. That's a broad term. So we have lacto-ovo vegetarian, which is, is someone who does not eat meat, fish, or fowl, but eats dairy and egg products. And ovo vegetarian is someone who doesn't eat flesh, but does consume egg products. And a lacto-vegetarian eats dairy, but doesn't consume those other products. A vegan is someone who doesn't eat any animal products, which include no meat, no fish, no poultry, no dairy, no honey. And this might sound very restrictive, but as you'll see, there actually is some amazing options. It's not a diet of deprivation. There are some delicious recipes and quick things you can make that will make this practical and, and usable. Now, in addition to not consuming animal products, vegan also encompasses a philosophy of non-injury to other living beings. So we do not use animal products as far as feasible, which include silk, leather, fur, because they cause cruelty and exploitation to these animals. We also don't attend circuses that use animals because of the abuse involved. And we don't condone other forms of exploitation that occurs in society uh, to animals. So starting off with the health aspect, and I ha the handout I gave you goes into detail about the conclusions from a very important nutritional study which was done called the China Project. It's the largest study of human nutrition ever conducted in China. And the reason that's relevant is China is a homogenous society in terms of the genetic variability for the most part compared to other parts of the world, like say here in America where there's so much genetic diversity because we, we're kind of a, a hodgepodge of so many different cultures and, and backgrounds and ethnic heritages. So often you'll hear, well, you know, such and such runs in your genes. This person has a, a genetic propensity towards cancer. And that might be true. However, what we don't always realize is that nutritional and environmental factors have a greater influence on health outcomes than our genes. And that's actually really good news because once we realize that we actually have control to a large degree over our health destiny, we can make in empowering decisions which improve our health outcomes and help us live longer, healthier, and more enjoyable lives. So this study was conducted by Dr. T. Colin Campbell and along with other renowned scientific researchers who collaborated with him. And they, they found a lot of really interesting things. Uh, how many of you have heard that milk does a body good or that it, you need milk to have strong bones? That message is blasted in our media. It's a propaganda that's drilled into people's heads to make them think that they need milk for calcium. Well. You can find calcium in all kinds of foods besides milk. Where do the cows get the calcium? They eat grass if they're being fed a normal, natural diet for them, that is. So they actually get it from the ground, to be more exact, the, the, the minerals in the ground that the grass grows in. But 
any strong herbivorous animal, such as a rhinoceros, a elephant, cow, these are all herbivores and they're very strong and muscular animals. So we don't need to be eating meat in order to get enough protein and that's another myth, which I'll get to more later. But just with osteoporosis, what they actually found is uh, since in China there's almost, well now that's changing unfortunately because they're adopting Western habits, but most Chinese consume little if any dairy and they actually consume low amounts of calcium in general. Yet they're actually at a, a much lower risk for osteoporosis than people in the West. Animal protein actually acidifies the blood causing calcium to be leached from the bones in order to buffer the acidity that is caused by animal-based diets. Animal foods, meaning meat, milk, dairy products, eggs, those are acidifying versus plant foods that come from plants like beans, vegetables, fruits, these are more alkalizing. And when our body is in an acidic state, it actually is a disease-promoting state. So we don't wanna have that uh, for a number of reasons, and, and osteoporosis is one of the reasons. Now, high cholesterol is another very common health concern. A lot of people are on Lipitor, and that drug has some side effects that are undesirable. It also doesn't address the main root issue, which can be addressed many times, most of the time, through diet modification. And unfortunately, doctors don't get trained in nutrition properly. Most of them get mostly training in medications and surgery. And so that's what they know. And so if someone goes to the doctor, has their blood checked, and it shows high cholesterol, they put them on a medication. They don't counsel them about what nutritional things they can do to change their health destiny. So cholesterol is only found in animal products. It is not found at all in plants. We do need cholesterol to be healthy. However, our body makes cholesterol. So we have all the cholesterol we need through our liver producing it. So there's no need to eat additional cholesterol found in animal products. When someone has high cholesterol, it actually increases the risk for a number of cancers, including leukemia, uh, cancer of the liver, colon, rectum, lung, and brain cancer. Now interestingly, cholesterol levels in China range from 90 to 170 milligrams per deciliter, but in the US, that range is typically much higher from 170 to 290 milligrams per deciliter. So even though the Chinese have, in generally, uh, lower cholesterol levels in general, those at the higher end of the Chinese range have a significantly uh, higher rate of cancer and heart disease than those at the lower end. So that's, that's really important to understand too because when we're in a society that has two thirds of the population overweight or obese, which is the case here in, in our country, sometimes our view of what is healthy can be a bit skewed because we're, we're not really comparing ourselves to true health. So uh, in the case of heart disease, this is at an epidemic level. One in two adult men die of a heart attack and heart disease is the number one killer still in the US of adults. And it's actually, the incidence of deaths from heart disease is 17 times higher amongst American men as it is among the Chinese. Now, there's good news here because again, this is something we can change through adopting healthy lifestyle patterns and most importantly, adopting a whole foods vegan diet. It's actually been shown through this study and clinical trials on patients suffering from heart disease, some of whom were told by their expert cardiologists they would not live out the year that heart disease not only can be prevented through dietary modifications, it can actually be reversed. In fact, some of the people you may have heard of, uh, Bill Clinton being one who went through surgery to remove blockages in his arteries, decided to adopt a plant-based diet because he read the research that Caldwell Esselstyn, one of the doctors who's also featured along with 
Dr. T. Colin Campbell in a documentary called Forks Over Knives, which I highly recommend, and showed patients who had the blockages in their arteries open up, and they actually compared before and after the, the changes were dramatic. And this was not on any medication. This was simply getting rid of the animal foods and the processed oils and refined flour and sugar and, and getting on a whole foods plant-based diet. So what are whole plant foods? Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, which include a variety of grains, millet, rice, corn, oats, amaranth, quinoa is a great grain, uh, legumes of many different types. There are so many different types of beans, c dozens of types of beans and lentils, nuts and seeds. Now, what makes food taste good? Adding herbs and spices to it. That's what makes something taste delicious. So you can make a whole endless variety of delicious combinations using these ingredients and some herbs and spices added, which also have health-promoting benefits. You can see the variety of colors in vegetables, and those colors are important. They, they carry vitally beneficial phytonutrients that promote health and ward off cancer. So here are just a few options that I have taken over the years, pictures of different dishes. Uh, peanut tofu skewers, roasted veggies and cheeseless lasagna. They're really making strides in the nut-based and plant-based cheeses these days. So if you love cheese and you love ice cream or whatever it is that you just think you could never give up, don't worry. There's a plant-based vegan option for you that will satisfy that craving. Then there, uh, this is from Native Foods, uh, Bangkok Curry Bowl. I, go, I eat there all the time. I'm spoiled because living in LA, there's so many vegan restaurants. But even if you live in Kansas, I have friends who live in the middle of the Midwest and they can be vegan. It just takes a little more creativity, but you can do it. Sesame kale macro bowl with tempeh and a side of cucumber salad. I mean, this is gonna keep you full. You're not gonna be hungry after you eat this. Ethnic cuisines. Ethiopian, Thai, Indian, Persian, Japanese. Here we see on the left, uh, oops, let's see. That's an Ethiopian plate. Um, if you've never eaten an Ethiopian restaurant, you're missing out because it's, they have amazing different variety of spices and, and it's just delicious. And here's a, a Thai curry, more different curries here. I mean, tofu, vegetable, brown rice, I mean, it's all you need. So now I wanna um, switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, the, the, what goes on with um, cows. Now, the reason that cows give milk is to produce milk for their offspring. And they have to be kept pregnant or lactating in order to produce milk. And what happens is they, they're continually impregnated and their babies are taken away from them. In fact, the, the baby boy calves are taken away on their first day of life and, and they're made into veal. So there's a lot of cruelty inherent in that, um, but there's also some serious health issues related to dairy consumption. As I mentioned, uh, the osteoporosis issue is a, is a huge concern. There's also a lot of uh, concern surrounding allergies to dairy protein. It is mucus producing, it can irritate the airways, it can increase the incidence of asthma. I know a number of people who uh, used to suffer from allergies and asthma who improved dramatically once they cut out dairy from their diets. It's also been linked to type one diabetes and because it has something called insulin-like growth factor one or IGF-1, it is actually a cancer promoter. So if you think about that being important for a calf to grow into a you know, 80 pound calf to grow into a 400 pound steer, that growth factor has an important purpose in that situation. But for a, an adult human or even a, a baby a, a human to consume this, it, it's not serving the purpose that it should be. So it's the ideal food for calves, but it is not the ideal food for hu humans. 
dairy cows are also often given hormones to increase their milk productivity. And they're usually slaughtered by their fifth birthday because by that point, their milk productivity has declined to where it's no longer profitable to keep them. The calves that are taken away, the, the male calves that are taken from them because they don't produce milk, are kept in crates where they can't move around. And they're denied access to other calves, so they don't have that social interaction. There's actually a lot of grieving that goes on between the mother and the baby that are taken away from each other. They're supposed to have that bond, and when that bond is broken, it is, it's a terrible mourning process they both go through. And then the veal calf is slaughtered usually by uh, four months of age. If it weren't for this industry, these cows could be living out to be 25 to 30 years of age. In fact, I've visited a number of farmed animal sanctuaries and have seen cows that are around that age and living happily. So it's, it's really terrible what they go through. Now, one of, one of the other things that uh, Dr. T. Colin Campbell discovered in his research was that cancer development is actually turned on by animal protein consumption. And it's turned off by plant protein even if cancer is already initiated. So I mentioned earlier a documentary called Forks Over Knives, which I hope you all check out. You can find it online at forksovernives.com or on Netflix. And it is very inspiring and uplifting. There's no graphic footage in it. It's easy to share with your family and friends. And it, it shows one of the studies that was done that illustrated cancer being turned on and turned off simply by changing the amount of casein in the diet, and casein is the principal protein in dairy. For optimal health, protein should actually only be about 8 to 12 percent of calories. And this might come as a surprise because we've been brainwashed to think that we need protein, protein, protein all the time, everywhere. Where do you get your protein? People think, you know, I'm going to just fall off a cliff or something because I don't have meat in my diet. But I've been vegan for 15 years, and I was raised vegetarian, and I've never had problems with protein deficiency. So that idea is one of those misnomers that is promoted by the meat industry to get people to consume more of their product. Rhinoceros, elephants, all kinds of plant-based herbivores are getting all the protein they need from the plants. And even bananas and fruits have protein. So just because you're not eating tofu or beans doesn't mean you're not getting protein. The important thing is to eat a whole plant food, though. So if you're eating white flour, white sugar, oil, those foods are just empty calories. They're not providing your body with the nutrients that it needs. So now we're going to talk a little bit about breast cancer. As we heard from Parisa Kosravi in her wonderful speech yesterday, it is a disease that affects about one out of eight American women. And the death rate in America for breast cancer is five times the rate in China. So there are some key things to understand about breast cancer. It is associated with high dietary fat intake, high blood cholesterol, high blood estrogen, high blood testosterone, and importantly, early age at first menstruation. It's become apparent that over the past few decades, girls have been reaching puberty at earlier and earlier ages. And it's believed to be largely due to the animal protein in their diets. Because they're reaching that puberty at an earlier age, their bodies are exposed to more estrogen, which puts them at a greater risk for not only breast cancer, but other hormonal cancers, as well as metabolic syndrome and early death. So the countries that have the highest rates of meat consumption also have the highest rates of breast cancer. With pr prostate cancer, we have a similar uh, situation. One in 10 American men will get this disease, and that's probably an underestimate. Eating animal protein, especially dairy protein, increases the testosterone, which triggers rapid growth of prostate cancer, versus a low-fat, high-fiber diet, in other words, a vegan diet, lowers cholesterol to healthy levels. 
American men eating the highest fat diets had almost eight times more advanced prostate cancer compared to men eating the least fat. Dairy intake is as strongly linked to prostate cancer as cigarette smoking is to lung cancer. So what is it about plant foods that's so wonderful? Well, there are a lot of things. It's not one little thing you can pull out of a carrot or a blueberry and take it in a pill and then you're going to be healthy. That's not how it works. It's a whole symphony of nutrients that are working together in the whole natural form of the food that does its magic. So you'll maybe come across studies here and there which show that people who took this or that supplement didn't have a good health outcome. And then people wonder, well, you know, there's all this confusion about health and nutrition. But part of the reason for that is that there's what's referred to as a reductionist approach to medicine and nutrition, meaning that people sometimes focus on individual nutrients, hoping that vitamin A or vitamin E or vitamin C will be their magic miracle vitamin that will solve all their health woes. But they don't understand that it's actually the whole food with the vitamins, the minerals, the water, the fiber, the antioxidants, all these phytochemicals that work together to have the health-promoting effects that we all want and need. So antioxidants are found primarily in whole plant foods, such as fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Blueberries are very high in antioxidants. A lot of foods that are berries, especially, are, are really good to include in your diet. Even if you're not a fruit person, please eat at least a few servings of berries as much as you can. It would be helpful. And then fiber is also very important. And fiber is only found in plant foods. You don't find any fiber in meat, milk, eggs, and, and other animal products. Most Americans get way too little fiber, only about 100, uh, 11 grams of fiber a day, which is about one-third as much as the average Chinese person who consumes 33 grams of fiber a day. And for breast cancer prevention, it's recommended to have at least 40 grams of fiber a day. So that means you need to be eating beans, whole grains, whole fruits with the, with the skin, and, and vegetables. And that also protects against bowel cancer as well as lowering cholesterol, cholesterol levels because it helps get that out of the system. Isn't that a nice, colorful array of fruits and vegetables? That's what nature intended for us to be eating. So when it comes to the environment, there are a lot of significant concerns with the way animals are raised and the billions of pounds of manure that would pollute our lakes and rivers as well as our drinking water. We've heard about the severe drought that California has been experiencing and a lot of the water, most of the water that is used is used for animal agriculture. There's also the, the issue of how to deal with the waste that's produced by these farmed animals, which is a vast amount that it, it presents a huge environmental problem. And we're seeing more and more invasion into west wetlands, forests, and other natural ecosystems and wildlife habitats, which have been decimated due to pollution and turning them into crop and grazing land to raise cows and other livestock. We also have a problem with the scarce fossil fuels and the global warming issue because the, the bigger contributor to global warming, more so than all of transportation combined, is the methane emissions from the livestock industry. So if you want to be green um, environmentalist, please do not eat animal products. There's a graph that shows the different contributions from various sectors to greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see here, this is a big, big chunk. 18% is from livestock. And that, that may be actually a little lower than what the more recent uh, calculations are. But this here is from industry, transport. And now a lot of this is also transporting animal goods too, which is more energy intensive because we're talking about live animals here. Uh, bacon doesn't come from a bacon tree. 
comes from a, a pig who fought every step of the way before that pig turned into bacon. Over 10 billion animals are slaughtered for food just in the United States. And that doesn't include the marine animals, which are not even counted. If you look at worldwide, uh, the number is, is over 50 billion. And again, it does not include fishes, sharks, or whales. Now, when it comes to seafood, the effects on the water, on the ocean, is really devastating. Uh, there is something called bycatch, which means that when, say, shrimp is being trawled, the net is so fine that it'll pick up sea turtles, dolphins, all kinds of other creatures in the ocean that end up dying because they're of no use to that particular fisherman who is only interested in catching the shrimp. So they end up throwing those animals overboard and in many cases they, they are injured or dying from that trauma. And of course it's totally in vain. But not only that, there's mercury contamination in a lot of the seafood. And there's a, a really good documentary called End of the Line, which talks about how our oceans are being decimated and so overfished that by 2048, it's predicted they'll be completely depleted if we continue at the rate we're going with overfishing. Some of the other things that go on uh, in factory farming include mutilations without anesthesia, debeaking, uh, forced uh, removal of the tip of a beak of a hen because they're kept so tightly crammed, they go crazy and peck at each other, which is what they would do in a natural setting to establish a pecking order. But instead of having the space they should have to be able to run off or defend themselves, they're crammed in a space that each hen has less than an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper worth of space, not even enough to spread her wings or nest or dust bathe. So they, t they cut the tips of their beaks off, but they do it without any painkiller, no anesthetic. Again, other mutilations include dehorning, castration. I do spays and neuters on dogs and cats as a veterinarian. I would never dream of r not giving my patient anesthetic and pain reliever for castration, but, but this is done routinely every single day. It's a standard industry practice. It's not an isolated event that this wayward farm they, they're not doing it, it's like, they all do it that way. It's about saving money, that animals are just considered production units. And in egg laying operations, male chicks are destroyed on their first day of life because they don't produce eggs. So here are a few images. It's not pretty to look at and no one enjoys thinking about it, but I think we need to be aware of what's happening because we owe it to the animals to see with our eyes what they endure with their bodies. Now what about hungry people? Worldwide, uh, nearly a billion people suffer from chronic hunger. That's a huge number. And about three quarters of those are children under the age of five. So instead of being eaten by people, the vast majority of the grain that's harvested in the US is fed to farmed animals. And about 12 pounds of grain are required to produce one pound of grain-fed beef. Now, I'm not going to stand here and try to claim that if everyone goes vegan, then we're going to solve world hunger, because it is a complex problem. However, because of the huge amount of waste from non-sustainable practices related to animal agriculture and the just sheer inefficiency of it, it is clear that it would be greatly alleviated if more people reduced their animal product in intake and went into the vegan direction. So we've all seen these pictures before. Again, not pleasant to look at, but we owe it to them to see what our, with our eyes what they endure with their bodies. So hopefully <laughs> I've convinced you of the importance of being vegan. And assuming you're interested in this, and want to pursue it further, uh, I want to go over some guidelines because a lot of people have an enthusiasm for this but sometimes find it impractical in their everyday lives. And I understand that because most people aren't vegan. We don't live in a vegan world. But the good news is vegan foods are becoming more and more available. It's becoming a lot easier than it used to be. Even 10 or 15 years ago, 
to find vegan options. And so the trend is going in that direction. I would urge you to be patient with yourself and don't consider it an all or nothing proposition. Just because you're not willing to go completely vegan overnight, let's say, doesn't mean you can't make steps towards that. So there are programs called Meatless Mondays, for example, where people decide to not eat any meat on Monday, you know, make it a completely plant-based day. See how you feel. Maybe then extend it to Tuesday and Wednesday. And then before you know it, just be a seven-day meatless person. And, and you, you may be surprised at how good you actually feel. Join a local vegan society. Attend vegan potlucks. Look for recipes. All you need is a few recipes that you really like. It's not like you have to have a different recipe every single day. But try out a few different ones and, and see what works for you. And then you can make big batches that last for the rest of the week. You can get a, a veg starter kit from Vegan Outreach or PCRM, which is the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And they, they're a really great resource, too, on their website, pcrm.org. Most health food stores and supermarkets even nowadays have soy milk, almond milk, rice milk, coconut milk, all these uh, vegan plant milks. So this is what the daily food guide should look like on a vegan diet. It should com be comprised mostly of pulses, whole grains, brown rice. Bread is, is something to be kept to somewhat of a minimum um, unless it's sprouted whole wheat bread or whole grain bread. And then after that, you want to focus on your vegetables and fruits and your nuts and seeds in, in sparing amounts because they are high in fat and calories even though they have the good fat. You don't want to overindulge on those. And then, of course, your beans are, are very important too. So we mentioned the concerns about protein are unfounded. There are a lot of misconceptions around that because of the effects from the dairy and meat industries promoting their propaganda. It's almost impossible to be protein deficient if you're consuming enough calories and you're eating a varied diet. It's normal to feel hungry sometimes when you're first starting out because you may not have enough room in your stomach for as much food as you'll need to get through you a certain period of time because plant foods are more fibrous. They're, they're fiber filled. So they'll fill you up, which is actually a good thing, especially if someone's trying to shed unwanted pounds. But then you might find that a few hours later you're hungry again, which is okay. There's nothing to worry about. You just have a snack. You know, you just have some uh, trail mix or fruit or, you know, whatever you like, really. I mean, it doesn't have to be any particular food that you're not – it's not a diet. This is a lifestyle. It's a, it's a new way of living. So think of it that way, and then it won't be as, as overwhelming. B12 is important because that is a supplement which has to be supplemented. It's found in animal products only because it comes from bacteria. So there actually are meat eaters who are deficient in B12. But it is something that vegans need to make sure they pay attention to. So I take a sublingual B12, which I uh, get from uh, – there's actually a vegan grocery store near where I live called Viva La Vegan. But it's also at Whole Foods Market and Trader Joe's. I like the Jero brand. It's the sublingual. It goes under your tongue. It seems to be absorbed more efficiently. Iron is found from many different plant-based sources, including whole grains and leafy green vegetables. And if you are concerned about iron, then just make sure you take an, a vitamin C-rich food with the iron-containing food, the same meal. So uh, I think we're about to wrap up here, but I uh, just want to mention about omega-3 fatty acids, which are also very important for anyone's health, regardless of vegan or, or not. And that can be found from flax seeds, walnuts, hemp seeds, and, and other sources. Chia seeds are also a good source. And calcium, again, many sources, including various leafy green vegetables, broccoli, kale, chard, fortified soy milk. And uh, here's some ideas for breakfast, whole grain toast with banana, nut butter, oatmeal and raisin, cinnamon, tofu scramble instead of scrambled eggs. I hear some uh, lunch and dinner ideas, um, bean soup, tofu veggie stir fry, brown rice and vegetable potato stew, 
no cheese vegetable pizza and whole grain crust, different cuisines. And here's some additional resources. So uh, I don't know, do we have time for some questions? Or does anyone have any questions? Yes. I was wondering why honey is considered an animal product that you would not want to consume and how that hurts the bees. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, honey is produced by bees to nourish their own bees, the, the glands they have to you know, provide nutrition for their families. And in that sense, it's taking from them something that's not ours to take. But I know some people have a different view of that and so on and so forth. So it's not as crucial of an issue as, as some of the other things I've mentioned in my talk. So I think, you know, if you want to have honey in, y in your diet, I, you know, I'm not going to no, say actually that's... I didn't even <laughs> know that honey was produced for the sake of the young. I thought it was just a byproduct of, uh, it of it pollination. Is, it is helpful for them to oh. feed uh, their colony. So oh, very good. I mean, there may be some ways in which honey can be produced in an ethical way. Uh, and, and, you know, people sometimes bring up different scenarios of what if I have a, a chicken in my backyard? Is it okay to have the eggs from that chicken? And, you know, these different scenarios, which may come up on occasional basis, but for the most part, the vast, vast, vast majority of animal products that we find in the supermarkets, even if they're labeled free range or cage free or humanely raised, any of that lingo, it's, it's what I would call humane washing, meaning that they want people to buy their product so they can make themselves feel better, that they're doing something more ethical. But when you actually see undercover videos of what happens on these places, regardless of how they call themselves, even if they're calling themselves free range, it is not a pretty picture of what happens to these animals. I've seen what happens. They're very overcrowded. They're filthy sheds that keep them inside these. They don't get sunlight. They, they're still slaughtered at the end. They're still de-beaked. So yeah, I mean, unless you really have a chicken in your backyard who's having an idyllic existence, then the eggs you're buying are probably not humane. Manik. I just want to make a quick comment that uh, you know, in India, there is a Parsi vegetarian society. And so many Parsi, not many, but you know, quite a significant number of Parsis actually practice uh, eating vegetarian food. And one time I had uh, written something about that or some other uh, related issue. And there is a priest in India called uh, Edward Rowington Peer, who, whose father had written a book about you know, the, veg the reasons why the vegetarian food is better. And, uh, you know, he had sent me a copy of that. So, you know, it's a very well uh, confirmed uh, thing to have. Thank you, Manik. That's really great to know. Hello. Hi. Um, one of the reasons that I stopped eating meat is because I was told that when the animal is about to be slaughtered, it fills with adrenaline or it fills with other hormones of fear. And then obviously that's all transferred into us when we consume it if we ever have. I just wondered if that was true. Yeah, I've heard that also, that the animals definitely experience fear and more than just fear, terror. I mean, their lives are literally being taken from them and it's the most terrifying thing. They don't want to die. So they are surged up with adrenaline and that definitely affects their tissues which are then consumed by people. So I think that and that might be controversial to, to talk about, but the, I've talked to people who used to eat meat and went vegan and found that they were less aggressive, less prone to being upset or kind of uptight about certain things after switching to a, a vegan diet. You spoke a lot about the healthy vegetables and, and showed us a beautiful picture of all the broccoli and carrots and everything. What are, so if one is to uh, go that route, what are the ramifications of all the studies on pesticides and everything that are used on those vegetables and fruits? And if that's the case, which, which are 
definitely cancer causing and deadly to our bodies. Uh, do you recommend going organic in that route mm -hmm. or, um, you know, and which can also become quite expensive. Uh, you know, it's not only a change of diet, but it's also, um, is it financially sound? You know, what, what's, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, do you eat all organic vegetables and fruits to avoid the pesticide uh, I problem? Well, I do a combination of shopping at the farmer's markets where I, most of the produce I get is either organic or pesticide free. But eating a, an inorganic plant-based diet is healthier than an organic meat-based diet because the, the crops that are fed to the cows and other livestock are mostly GMO, genetically modified, which is a whole other lecture she didn't have time to get into. Uh, maybe uh, Don will mention something about that. But the, the foods that the animals are eating are usually filled with pesticides, and that's not helpful for us to be consuming. Now, a quick note about the expense. I like to think of healthy eating as an investment in my health, so I'd rather pay a little bit more right now and eat healthy food than pay a lot more later on w because of a disease that comes up due to not eating healthfully. One thing I also wanted to mention is that type 2 diabetes, which is a huge problem in this country, is preventable and reversible through a whole foods vegan diet. And that's also mentioned in Forks Over Knives, that documentary I mentioned. So thanks. Yes. Actually, we do have vegetarian, Parsi Vegetarian Temperance Society in USA also, and it was formed in, found in 1926 by a Parsi gentleman. And also, myself, being a priest, I am a vegetarian. And as a child, I was a vegetarian, but then as I was growing up in my teen years, like we have this concept that if you don't eat meat, you're not going to become strong. So I started, I, started, I became a non-vegetarian. And then in my later years, uh, when I was about 30, in in a in our calendar, Baman Maino, we are vegetarians. So I was just relishing the thought that there are ten days left, and I would be making butter chicken and uh, chicken biryani. And next second, a thought came to my mind that at what expense I would be satisfying my taste buds. Somebody would be giving their life to satisfy my taste buds, and that it was just one second thing. I became a vegetarian, mm -hmm. and also talking about the protein. Uh, in 1995, there was a Mr. Universe from India. M Mr. Universe, so he has to have big muscles, right? He was a total vegetarian. His name was, uh, he was from Punjab, Mr. Prem Singh. So, like, you know, you could definitely get your protein from vegetable source. And if you, if you really feel if you want to become a vegetarian, you can become in one second also. And uh, Armit, a question for you. Is there any alternative for honey? Yes, there's so much available. Maple syrup is a good one that has a lot of nutrients, including calcium. You can also use stevia, which is calorie free if you're trying to be watching your calorie intake. And then there's agave nectar, so many things. There are uh, also bee free honey, which is like made from fruit juice extract. And also from the religious point of view, Zarathustra was giving food to animals and we started became, become making animal our food. In Gathas, it is very clear. In Nyashas, it is very clear that we should be vegetarians. And there are a lo lot of uh, scriptural evidence that we should be vegetarians and uh, remain abstained from meat. In fact, the uh, high priest of Sasanian times, Adarbad Marespan, in his uh, last uh, talk, he's saying that even if you have a spoonful of camel or kine or cow, which was slaughtered m thousands of miles away, you are as much as sinner as the person who slain that animal. Th yeah, it's thanks. just, if, if you're not willing to do it yourself, then are you willing to pay someone else to do it? Because that's what you're doing if you're purchasing those things. So thank you very much, oh. uh, and please feel free to come up with questions and contact me. My email is veganvet at gmail.com. Thank you.